feelings of individuals, but they accept the class system and restrictions on women's freedom. Where are the servants, farmers, and tradesmen on which your wealthy character's prosperity rests? They are invisible. There will never be justice as long as we accept the vast gulfs between the comfortable and the poor, the ceaseless preying on the vulnerable by the rich, the institutions of church and crown and propriety. What is your propriety but a mask? I want to tear that mask away to expose the inhumanity beneath to healing sunlight. I want men and women to see beyond the surface of the, to the soul and to treat each other with equality and freedom, following the impulses of their hearts. I find the things you write about tedious. <laughs> My characters dress better. <laughs> have better posture and are funnier. Yours stand in storms on top of glaciers and rent. At least mine get out of the parlor. <laughs> they act on their feelings. In Sense and Sensibility, Eleanor and her mother passively spend a hundred pages wondering whether or not Willoughby is proposed to Marianne and never think to ask her. You can't let them ask her because then the story would be over. <laughs> Eleanor and her mother could not imagine that Marianne would give herself away without exacting a promise from Willoughby. As for passivity in Frankenstein, every time the monster is about to do some dire thing, your victor faints away. <laughs> The demon threatens to be with him on his wedding night. So what does Victor do? He gets married. When he proposes to Elizabeth, who has been waiting for years without an explanation, he says he will reveal the horrible secret the day after they marry. And, the, and then she marries him. You can be sure that Elizabeth Bennett or Eleanor Dashwood would ask a few more questions. You can't twist a plot without skating over some thin ice. We both do it. You're right, we do. But it's not just in your fiction that you skate over thin ice. I don't think you're running off with a married man, father of a child at the age of 17 in the company of Lord Byron, the most notorious libertine of Britain, was the act of a sensible person. It troubles me to see you put yourself at so much, so much at risk. Worse than my Mariah Bart Bertram of Mansfield Park, if one of my characters were to behave in that way, she would come to ruin and ruin her family in the bargain. I take your point about putting myself at risk. I was very young and in love. It proved to be no picnic. In my eight years with Percy, I had six pregnancies, one ending in miscarriage and one a daughter born prematurely who died soon after. I gave birth to four full-term children, all but one of them died by the age of three. My husband Percy chased his poetic fancies with other women and drowned in a foolish boating accident. After his death in the effort to support myself and my surviving son, I lived by my pen. I cannot imagine how hard that must have been. I'm sorry for you. I may disapprove, but I would not have written about characters like Lydia Bennett if I did not see the attractions of a life of passion. Yet I never married, and I had no children. I had an offer, and I said yes, but thought better of it and turned it down the next day. I was right to do so. He was large and dull without conversation, and when he did speak, he was devoid of tact. So instead, I lived with my sister and supported myself with my pen. My favorite pastime as a child was writing stories. Frankenstein was published when I was not yet 20. My favorite pastime as a child was writing stories. I f finished first impressions, you know, it is Pride and Prejudice, when I was 21. It's a hard life for a woman author. I couldn't even put my name on my first novel. The title page said, by a lady. Neither could I, but I didn't even get the lady. <laughs> <laughs> Most people thought Percy wrote Frankenstein. There are even critics today who argue that Percy wrote it. Men. Men. 